Hey, this is Rob Swanson with The Real Estate Mogul Show. Let's get into it. Hey, what's up, everybody? Rob Swanson here with another episode of The Real Estate Mogul Show. Hey, we've got some people in the studio again. We've got Henry, we've got Mike, we've got Joe pushing the buttons. Uh, gentlemen, give us a little bit of a uh, hello for the week. Go ahead, Mike. You were, you were absent last yeah, week. Yeah, fired yeah, up. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I had a week away in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, so that was fun. Nice. Trip with uh, our family and my mom and dad. Heck yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, they're, uh, we celebrated a little early, but fifty their 50th wedding anniversary is this summer in August, so we, uh, we took an early trip, but that was exciting. Nice. Yeah, I like really it. Cool. Really I cool. like it. Henry. Yeah, Mike was gone, and I had to go fishing by myself this weekend. Man, so. we carried the show, though, huh? <laughs> I thought you were going to say life was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, we missed you. We missed you. We did miss you. It was, it was uh, I mean, we we did it okay, but it, was, it wasn't as the same without you. Rob <laughs> told a story about you, too. Oh, he did? Yeah, he told about your uh, incredible acquisition success in your first month. My incredible yeah, you remember back. Success. You remember back to May, May two thousand eight. Yeah, How many houses did we buy in that first month? Uh, Rob, you have a better memory than I do on this. Oh my <laughs> word! Uh, I remember that we were we were moving at a run rate of give or take twenty or so, but I don't remember the exact numbers. Yeah, that, yeah, that was my introduction into uh, real estate investing. <laughs> yeah, uh, month number one, like twenty houses. 20, I think it was 22 houses we bought in that first month. He did say you bought one that he wasn't too, he wasn't too <laughs> jazzed about. Yeah, do you remember the house on 9th? Yeah, with the cockroaches. No, that was Galena. Okay. That was Galena. The one on 9th was the one that didn't have a foundation. Got it. Remember that addition? Yeah, I remember there were a couple that um, the cockroaches stand out. And that I think that one had uh, needles in the basement too, right? Yeah, that was a drug house for sure. Yep. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then we got Joe over here punching the buttons. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited. It's uh, We got this uh, real estate mogul sign up. Um, you know, each week the sets sort of slowly progressed. And, uh, yeah, it's looking good. I'm excited to sit here and uh, listen to this conversation. Heck, yeah. Well, the, the whole conversation this week is kind of carrying on the theme from last week. We, we had started talking about the importance of making offers in someone's real estate investing business. And the reason we were talking about that is, you know, going back to Henry beginning, uh, the real estate investing journey, one of the things that we taught you from the very beginning, and one of the things that you see interacting with FreedomSoft customers on a regular and daily basis is the people that have the most success are the people that figure out how to consistently make offers. And it is a fail forward sometimes effort, right? You don't always know because the, the price to pay is somewhat subjective, right? Exit strategy, like what do you plan to do with it, matters. Uh, your source of capital and funding matters. Uh, your availability to construction crews matters. Like all of the things matter. But at the end of the day, making offers is the key element. And so we're kind of carrying that theme forward this week. We've started the 100 Offer Challenge, and that is – a five-day challenge that we're doing to take people through our process of, of making offers, right? So, Mike, going back to May of 2008, we closed and bought a lot of real estate because we made a lot of offers, and that was the key. Yeah, and still is the key. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, um, that was my introduction into real estate investing. So I just thought that was normal. So... On the other side of it, as I started, you know, doing some coaching and talking to other investors, uh, making offers oftentimes is a massive hurdle. And so I didn't, I guess the advantage of, you know, my, my pathway into real estate was um, you just said, hey, Mike, it's day one. Here's what we're going to do. And I thought, okay, this is what everybody does. But that wasn't the case. But I didn't learn that until later, multiple months later. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what everybody, what you thought everybody did was you thought everybody made a lot of offers. Right. Because day one, your experience we here was, doing. Right. we were just making offers. Correct. Right. And then I learned a few months later that, wait a minute, 
this is not, it's what everybody needs to do, but it's not what a lot of people actually do. Right. And it's a big hurdle. And so uh, I love this topic. And, uh, you know, I, I had a unique experience into it. Henry can speak from the, um, you know, he had a very different introduction into real estate than I did um, that I would say is more common. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I realized later on the advantage that was because I just figured making offers is what you do. Yeah, Mike, this, when this episode uh, drops, it's going to be Tuesday and next week and people will be one day into the hundred offer challenge. Um, when you were back then, before you realized that ma- making offers wasn't what everybody did, um, and you were making these offers, did you hit a point where I think what we're going to have next week is people like get really excited and they're making offers and then they hit this point where some sort of pain happens or some thing comes up. Can you talk about a time there or tell a story about when you were making a lot of offers and you hit a pinch point? Um, and we spoke a little bit about this last week, but when you hit a pinch point and what did you do? Was it a mindset shift that you had to make? Was it an action shift? What, what was it that kind of pushed you through and got you to those 22 deals? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I'm trying to think back. This is a while. This is a while ago. Um, I don't, I don't recall a specific uh, pinch point. What I do recall is the norm that was set for me was, first off, it was a very different market. That doesn't, that's not relevant. You can make offers in any market, but the way we were doing it primarily is foreclosures were everywhere, bank-owned REO properties, and every new bank-owned REO that hit the market in Denver, we made an offer on. We made multiple offers on. I don't know if we're going to get into that topic, Rob, but we were running with two different entities. We made yep. multiple offers on every property. Yeah, interesting. Right. So our pinch point, from what I recall, was, and the only thing that was holding us back were how many new REOs were hitting the market, some days more than others. But we got multiple offers in on, on every single one of them, and that was the strategy. Um, as far as I, you know, Joe, it's a great question. I don't recall a specific uh, pinch point. I just remember just the the speed that we were moving, the momentum that we were moving at. Um, every new property that came in was game. We got an offer going out on it, um, and there wasn't, you know, the only. I'm just trying to think. The mindset was, hey, we're going to get an offer in on everything that every new bank owned REO that hits the MLS. Well, and and to take. To take that question, the pinch point question, and go back to then and translate it to now, I can tell you that for me, the the pinch point when I was learning this business was the either the confidence in my numbers, the number of opportunities I had to make offers on, or the confidence that I had that I could get it across the finish line and, and get it funded. So it, it was either the analysis piece, it was the opportunities piece, or it was the funding piece. Those typically are the pinch points that people run into. Mm-hmm. And, and it holds them back because they're not confident in one of those three things. And so if we take and, and fast forward to today's market, right? Today's market is not flooded with bank-owned inventory. And yet today's market, every city in the country has investors, homeowners, landlords, people that own real estate that are in a very similar situation that the banks found themselves in 14 years ago. And that is they own an asset that is not producing that is costing them money, that is doing something not to their benefit. Mm-hmm. And and so what we try to do today is instead of saying, hey, it's as easy as saying who are the banks and you know, let's just go make offers on bank owned properties. What we try to say is who are the sellers today that have a similar situation that is uh, causing a problem, right? The, the asset they own is not acting like an asset. It's acting like a liability. And we make offers on all of those. And a lot of times people sit back and they wait for that, for that lead to come in. 
And so, so there's the opportunity, right? So the first thing is the opportunity. Back in 2008, opportunity was everywhere. It was all publicly listed through the MLS. You could just go make offers galore. Today, it's more off-market opportunities, and yet those same opportunities are, quote-unquote, publicly listed. Anybody that's been around real estate investing for any period of time has learned that they can go build a list of opportunities of sellers that own properties that are in some form of distress, whether that's a a property condition of distress, or that's a personal life financial distress of the seller themselves. Everybody has figured out that they can build a list, and that list is your opportunity bucket. It's no different than the MLS was 14 years ago with bank owned properties. Today, it's off market sellers that have a certain distress. So the opportunity is easy to build. Then it's running the math, and it's running the numbers and most people aren't confident enough in running the math and running the numbers in order to make offers and so mike you can go you can go back to where we were in 2008 we had a very very fast process i mean we just took a percentage of their listing price uh, essentially made some assumptions on the condition of the property yep and made the offer like it was right. sixth grade math right and a lot of people are going to hear that comment and they're going to think that's psycho. How could you? And I only know this from coaching people. The, the general consensus is if, I'm go, if I was going to make an offer on a property, I would have to be 100% clear on the ARV. I would have to have walked through it. I would have to have you know, photos, video. I'd have to get three different bids from three different contractors before I could ever make an offer. And I I know I was going to, I was about to say, I think, I don't think, I know that's where a lot of people get caught up. And I, Rob, I think the mindset comes from when you buy a house or if people have thought about buying a house, they would never make a blind offer on a house. They would go see it probably multiple times. Yep. Make sure it feels right. What does it look like? Have it inspected prior to doing some of these things. And so they carry that mindset over to the investor side of real estate. And then they bump into a comment where it just says, hey, we just took the list price and picked a percentage and just fired out an offer. And they, like their head is about to explode, right? Like, how is that possible? Not only is it possible- I don't want to cut you off. Right, not only is it possible, it's the right way to do it. Yeah, and so I I was gonna let you keep going. And at the same time, I was like, I don't want to forget to make this thought. Because if you actually run the math, if you do all of that work to say, I'm, I'm going to walk the property, I'm going to create my walkthrough checklist, I'm going to get videos, pictures, I'm going to go have contractors bid the price, I'm going to do all of these things. And, and you do it perfectly. You estimate the ARV with, you know, five comps that have sold in the last 30 to 60 days and the sold price. And, you know, you figure everything out. The future fixed up value, the estimated repair costs, the the neighborhood, the exit strategy, you do all of that work. And then you go and you make an offer versus just saying, you know what, I'm going to make an offer at around 65% of the after repaired value or 60% or 75%. Markets change and there's some variation in those numbers. What you find is that your, your offer is almost the same every single time same price it's the same price that pause here for a second because people can't get their head around that newer investors particularly i i remember that there was a buyer that i was working with in st louis and uh i was at i was talking to him he told me he was a buyer and i i I was asking him the typical questions what do you buy where do you buy where don't you buy blah 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 And I said, let me ask you this. How do you run your numbers to know when you're looking at a deal? And he goes, oh, it's pretty complicated. I have this massive spreadsheet. (laughs) And so we're chatting. And uh, I just, I I said, "Um, would you mind sending me the spreadsheet? Let me take a look at it. I want to see how you run your math. And um, he thinks about it for a second. And he's like, yeah, I'll email it to you. So he emails it to me. And to your point, he's got this complicated, impressive looking spreadsheet. And I plugged in an example. And I was like, oh, this guy buys at 65%. Yeah. So in his mind, it needed to be, and I'm bringing this up because he's not, he's not alone. Right. 
where I think a lot of people get stuck is they maybe didn't know how to build a spreadsheet. This guy had some Excel skills, clearly, to even create this document. But you take all that out. I ran one, you know, kind of stock St. Louis deal through it. And I was like, oh, he buys it this percentage hmm. and took all of this in his mind, what needed to be really complicated and thought out. And I just turned it into a 65 percent formula. Right. Right. In 35 seconds. Exactly. And, and depending on the market, like if you took that long, deal's probably gone at that point. In, in some scenarios, it could be gone. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's an interesting one because the lens from which somebody approaches real estate often determines that there are some personality types. It, well, it, let me finish that thought. It determines whether they can move forward with speed or whether they fall prey to paralysis analysis. Mm -hmm. And there are some personality types like, like mine. I, I don't view risk at, in making an offer. What's the worst that could happen? No. They could say no. What's the second worst that thing that could happen? They could say yes, and I could find out that my assumptions were wrong, which I can then Adjust. renegotiate or cancel the contract. Or they could say yes, and I'm in a good position on a good real estate deal. Solving that seller's problem while at the same time putting myself in a position to make a profit. Because that is, at the end of the day, what we're all in it for. We're here to make a profit, and we're going to solve problems along the way in doing so. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip the lid here for a second. I have been, uh, through most of my career, the buyer, the investor buying either at a discount or on terms. But I've also been the seller, and I have been a motivated seller. And you guys will remember this little brick house that I owned in uh, Memphis. Uh, and I, own, I bought it. I bought it at a, at a good price. There was a tenant in it. It probably needed twelve dollars to $15,000 in rental grade repairs the day I bought it. But there was a tenant in there paying rent, had been in there for a number of years, and they had no intention of leaving. So when I bought the house, I didn't do anything to it. I, I didn't fix it up. I didn't disrupt the tenant. I, we, I had the property manager talk to them. The property manager took it over. The tenant was, was like, nope, I'm, I'm good. This is fine. And I was going to do windows and I was going to do paint and carpet and that kind of thing. But I mean, they were living in their own paint and carpet. Right. And so I just let it, I just let it roll. And the tenant stayed in that house for another three and a half years, continuing to pay. So, but when I bought the, the property, I used uh, private money. Uh, this was one that I didn't pay cash myself. I used private money. So I, I added some financing to it with a private lender. I overfunded so that I put the money to repair the house in my pocket, plus a profit up front, bought the house, stuck some money in my pocket and then continued to collect the rent and i had a net positive 350 to 375 dollar a month uh positive cash flow times three and a half years and then the tenant moved out and so and by the way i put like twenty five thousand dollars in my pocket up front when i bought the house that that was 12 to 15 to cover repairs if i needed to plus a little slush fund uh plus some profit, uh, non-taxable in my pocket the day I closed because I bought it at a significant discount. I put the cash flow in my pocket. I paid my private lender for three and a half years, and then the house went vacant. And then I looked at the house and I said, do I really want to own this asset in this neighborhood at this time? And my answer was no. And so rather than taking the money and fixing the house up and putting another tenant into it, I just decided to be a motivated seller. I just wanted out. I should have sent you a postcard. <laughs> you should have sent me a postcard. You, you, I would have given you. Uh, so, I had uh, borrowed. I, I paid like twenty-two thousand dollars for the house. I borrowed forty-seven, so I put twenty-five thousand dollars in my pocket. Forty-seven thousand. Um, rents on the house that, for the period of time that I owned it were seven ninety-five, so eight hundred bucks a month. 
Um, so I made my net positive cash flow. I paid my private lenders. I sold the house to a big um, turnkey operator that had been buying multiple houses in the area and then selling them for ridiculous numbers. But I thought I, I could either play that game or I wanted to just get my cash back out and go do something else with it. And so that's what I decided to do. I sold it for what I what I had into it, $47,000. And we knew that that buyer was vetted too, like they were a good buyer. We knew Yeah, that we had wholesaled to them in the yeah. past. Yeah, so we knew the buyer and I was a motivated seller. And so when I was a motivated seller, I was looking for my problem to be solved. I didn't want to deal with fixing it up. I didn't want to I just didn't want to deal with it. I had a better use of my time and the financial resources of that asset on other deals. And that's what I decided to do. So being a motivated seller helps you understand how making an offer that works for the investor is the key piece. Too many people are, are trying to figure out what does the seller want and there's a component of what does the seller want, but at the end of the day, every property has a price you can pay. And you know what? And let's dive in a little bit to the story of that house because you take it a different way, and this house now is still in your portfolio. What do you have to do to it? You got to go out there to Memphis, or you have to go and re um, connect with a crew of people that you can trust. You have to go through all these different steps. Um, from here, all the way from Colorado. And that's, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So um, that comes into it too. Like if I keep this house and I don't, I've already made some money in it, yep. so I can sell it at what I have into it, or I could walk down this other path. And I think if you were set up for, with those direct connections with a, a contractor that was actively working for you at the time, it would have been easier to do that. But yep. staring down a, you know, a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar rehab remotely and having to put those con connections back together is like a little bit more involved. Well, it it is. And you know, I had the connections to make that pretty easily. All I had to do was make one phone call to the property manager and it was it was done. Mm -hmm. Most sellers don't have that one phone call easy to make it happen ability. And so I had the money to fix it up. I had the crews in my back pocket and I was still a motivated seller. I still decided, you know what? I just want to sell this asset. I don't want to deal with it. I want to move on to something else. Right. And that's the, that's the thing about making offers that people have to understand. If you can put yourself in the mindset of the seller and understand what their potential challenges are, speak to those things and solve that problem, th this business isn't that hard. Yeah, even, a, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> There's an important point here that I, I don't want us to skip over. So Rob, you're really experienced investor over two decades in the business, what, over 1,500 transactions? I, I'm sure oh, you yeah. lost count a long time ago. Yeah. Last time I heard you throw out a number, you said you were approaching 2,000. So 1,500, a truckload of transactions. And you just told us that you sold a property and broke even on what you had borrowed. Yep. Here's what I don't want people to miss. You go into a property. Let's say you have access to FreedomSoft and you pull up a, a property snapshot and you're looking at data, right? And you've got 123 Main Street and you see an estimate uh, estimate of value on the house, let's say it's a hundred grand, and then you see a mortgage on it or a balance of fifty thousand. Yep. The inexperienced investor will see that price, and they'll never even consider the thought of, "I wonder if they'd sell for what they owe." Yep. It'll never cross their mind. They're going to go to, "Okay, this thing's worth a hundred grand. There's no way they're going to take less than 90. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the normal line of thought. And here we have experienced investor says, I owed 42 grand on the house and I sold it for 42 because you broke even, you didn't make anything at the sale, but you had made money when you bought it and you had made money for the last three and a half years. Yeah, I so made... It's not that you didn't make money. That's right. That's but right. you sold it for, for the balance right. with your private lender. Yeah. If you look, if you look at the, 
Uh, and I, I, man, I wish I could remember the address of that house. I can't remember the the street address. Uh, if I knew it, I'd I'd pull it up because if you look at the public records, it looks like I lost money or it looks like I broke broke even. The reality is I made almost forty thousand dollars on that house. Um, right, tw- twelve thousand dollars a year. Um, times three and a half, almost three and a half years. That's I why I'm bringing money. this up. Yeah. To the inexperienced investor, they would think it's ridiculous to ask a seller, hey, would you sell it for what you owe? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that's the point that I wanted to make is that's that a totally legit question. Yeah. The offer changes everything in this scenario. Like yep. you don't know until you know, right? Like if I would have caught you before you even had this mindset, you may not even have been thinking about selling that house yet. But if I would have made an offer to you, that would have gotten your gears churning about, do I actually want to be going through this, right? 100%. The, the offer in general, like, does it mean that you have to already know or get answers from the sellers that they're already going to be able to tell you, I need this, 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 and that? Yep. They may not even be thinking about that yet. And in Mike's scenario, right, the person that owes 50 grand, you know, that offer to get them out from underneath that, they may not they technically aren't having any problems making those payments maybe, but they could be in a similar situation that you were in saying, is it worth me holding on to this and continuing paying the mortgage or is my money better off in another situation where I could go and live a less stressful life out from under this mortgage, or I could go and take this money and invest it elsewhere that uh, is more life giving to me or something like that. Yep. But the offer is the start of it all. It gets it started. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I have that address if you want it. It's 920. Ah, nice. It's, what is here's it? Here's a, so Rob, while you're pulling this up, here's another perception thing. What is it? 920 Brandywine. 920. I remember this one. Brandywine. So let's say an investor Book comes across this home. property before you sold it. And they're thinking about making you a $50,000 offer. And in their mind, they're thinking, how could I send in this low of an offer? How could I lowball somebody like this? Right? Right. Because your your brain, everybody's brain starts playing tricks on them. Yep. And all these what ifs and the, these these comments jump into your head. Had somebody sent you a $50,000 offer on this thing, you would have said, holy crap, I would move it for what I owe, 42. Yeah, I'll take 50 right now. Mm-hmm. Yep. You can't, here's what I'm telling you, shut your brain off. You don't know the seller's scenario. You're thinking you're about to make a lowball offer and feel like a sleaze bag. They're thinking, holy crap, if that offer shows up, I'll jump all over it. Right. Because I'm making more money than I'm willing to make. Yep. You just, you can't, you have to, and it's harder, it's easy to talk about and it's really hard to do. Yep. You have to shut your brain off when you do this. But it makes the situation so much, like, because we're now seeing this deal on the, the back back end, right? Yep. Look at what it's sold for. 130 grand. This is two owners past you. Yeah, that's right. Right? Or one owner that's right. past you. And look how much money they made off of your deal, right? Yep. They still would have made the average, if not above average, return, even if they would have bought it for you in the offer that Mike's talking about, 50. Because yep. I, 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 to sell it for 127, well, I don't know how much money they put into it. But Yeah, let's go, let's go down here. We'll look at the sales history. Yeah, we sold it for forty-seven. Yeah, we sold it for forty-seven. So I, I sold it to Mid South for forty-seven. Uh, they sold it to Brandon for one hundred and twenty-seven. I'm gonna guess they put thirty grand into it, probably. Yeah, what's the square footage on it? Um, nine hundred. It's fairly fast. Twelve, fa- well, 12 fifty-two. Yeah. Fairly fast flip too. 20, yeah. sold it mid. Twenty-five to thirty, sixty-day flip. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's and, the back end. But you don't you still won. Oh, you got I, out of a house you didn't want to own. I'm happy. Right. I'm happy to have sold it cuz I right. I went and did other things and I didn't have to think about it. Uh, you know, that that's the that's the thing. So, if if a if a investor would have made me a terms offer, I would have sold it owner financing. Mm-hmm. Cuz I get how that game works. I I understand the, you know, I understand it. So, if you if you are a an investor and you want to make offers, you have two choices. You can make an all cash at a discount offer. Or you can make a, a terms offer at a higher price where the seller gets their money over time. I would have been happy to participate in that over time scenario, 
because I would have turned an asset that I was used to making money on with cash flow that went vacant, I would have turned it right back into a cash flowing asset by offering owner financing. And not so, dealing with and, the And the not property. dealing with yeah. it. And that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the thing, you know, uh, when you're sitting in the scenario as the seller, your perspective changes. And oftentimes, especially newer investors, they don't understand what the seller is thinking. I was thinking, I just don't want to deal with this particular house right now. I had other things going, wanted to do other things, wanted my focus and attention to go elsewhere. There's only so many hours in the day. And do I look at those guys making all of that money and saying, I should, I should have been there? No, because I got what I want out mm -hmm. of it. And that's the, that's the key piece. Somebody could have come across this and they see your LLC that owns it and they could make the assumption, yeah, this, you know, this property looks like it needs some work. I know it's vacant because it's on the U.S. Postal Service vacant list now, but this is an LLC. This is probably an investor buyer. They know what to do with it. I'm not going to bother making them an offer. Right. These are some of the nonsense that your brain kicks in. Right. You could have fixed this up and renovated it. Yep. You know how to do that. Yep. You could have fixed this up and sold it yep. and just turned it into a little fix and flip. You know how to do that. Yep. But the fact is you didn't want to do either, and that made you a motivated seller. That's right. So tell your brain to shut up. That's right. And make offers. Well, you, you can exactly. net, You don't know the scenario. That's great, right. Great point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop some secret sauce here. Okay. That point is where my mind was. was like I, all the lists I ever built in the beginning – I can't be dealing with LLCs. They're happy. They're happy in their situation. The last six contracts I've gotten, LLC owned. Yeah, that's right. And just by switching it up. What, so, where you came up with that idea to not build a list with LLCs, I have no idea because I know Mike didn't teach you that. Edgar taught him. You I guys know, were, yeah, I'm sure Edgar had you his guys, hand in you that. You guys already went home for the day, and I was in there churning in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, back on April 1st, I walked into Henry's office and I said, listen, man, don't even bother with LLCs. They're not interested. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And then I forgot to tell him later that that was an April Fool's thing. Yeah. Oh, well, so opportunities was, was one of the first things, right? So the, the opportunity. And last week, Mike, you were on vacation. Henry and I sat here and we were chatting. And... Too many people feel like they don't have the opportunities in front of them. And so if we go here into Freedom Soft, I'm going to show somebody, you know, 14 years ago, Mike, you, you and I, we were going to the MLS and saying, hey, give us every bank owned property because we're going to go make an offer on every single one of them. Fast forward to today, it's direct to seller off market because the bank owned inventory isn't there with the run that we've had for the last decade. But we go to Lead Finder and... I don't know, give me a, we're, we're going to go build a seller's opportunity list, right? A motivated seller's list. We're going to click that. We're going to go over here. I don't know. Let's just pick a, pick a city. Let's pick Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines. Yeah. Can we Des Moines, Iowa, check right? On that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and let's go over here. Let, hey, Rob, let's make sure people aren't hearing that the opportunity was in 08 and it's not today. No, no, no. That's it's, not. There is always massive uh, opportunity. The point that I'm buy. there's always motivated. That's sellers. right. The point I'm trying to make is that I want people to understand that as real estate markets change and they do change, one of the most constant things in real estate doing this for over 20 years is that every six months it changes, right? And so you've yep. got to always be learning and evolving and got to be plugged into what's happening in the market. 15 years ago, when you got started, Mike, it was bank owned REO. Today, it's direct to seller, off market. And like here in FreedomSoft with Lead Finder, we can build different types of motivation lists. And so, if we were to just go to Des Moines, Iowa, and build, say, a vacant property list, or we could build a tired landlord list. Henry, you talked last week about building the tired landlord list. Here's how you did it. And the only thing that you did, and I'll just point this out as, as a, a sidebar on our way to building this list. The only thing you did last week is you went into these advanced searches and you went down to the property type yep. and you added 
the uh, single family duplexes, triplexes, quads. Yep. I mean, all I know in the in the zip codes where I know that buyers in my market are, are really really honing in on right now. Yep. Is a heavy heavy multifamily yep. spot in my market. So I want to make sure that if I am indeed making the list smaller because of narrowing down the zip codes, I also want to make sure I'm making it as big as it can be by including the other types of properties that people are buying. That's so. right. That's right. And and that's the that's the point exactly mm-hmm. that I wanted to show here was that you, you didn't have to change any of the other default factors on this pre-built list. And in fact, you didn't have to go add the others, um, but you did by going to property type and just adding these others. Now, I'm keeping townhomes and condos off. You could go in and you could target townhomes and condos. The default is single family residential, and then you added duplexes, triplexes, and quads. Mm -hmm. So if we hide this and let's just go, let's just start with the vacant list and let's just search and let's just see what it comes up with. I have no idea, Des Moines, Iowa. So there are 909 vacant properties right now in the city limits of Des Moines. Now, you can see on the map the urban area around Des Moines. So there are some uh, suburbs and other little cities around the city of Des Moines. We could expand that to the county. We could expand that and add some other cities and get the whole metro area. But just in the city of Des Moines alone, we can we can go build a list of 909 and we'll we'll just do this because I want to, I want people to see uh, we'll just go I like to do it like this sellers uh, Des Moines vacant and we'll just we'll just leave it like that for right now um, we'll leave the uh, standard workflow and the list permissions we'll create the lead list. I've got 909 opportunities right now to make offers on. And people think what they have to do is take these 909 and go do a bunch of marketing and get 10, 12, 15, 20 inbound leads. Now, don't get me wrong. Those inbound leads are sometimes some of your best honed in. But how do you get those inbound leads? The way we do it is we make offers. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we played the game years ago it's how we play the game today it's how we've played the game the entire time i've got 909 opportunities sitting on my dashboard right now if i just go in and click on one and open up the snapshot let's just see what we've got there's there's a vacant house in des moines right now sitting there waiting for my offer Look at how enamored we are just staring at the screen. I just, this group loves looking at 912, 972 square foot houses. It's my bread and butter. I just dig it. I'm just thinking yeah. thinking about it. Hey, I had a couple coaching students over the years say, well, you know, the vacant ones are just under construction. The owner's just renovating them. Yep. Looking to place a tenant. That's a small, small percentage that of that vacant list. small It would be the ones percentage. that have... Even even of that cohort, it would even be rare, but it would be the people that had purchased it within the last month or two. And so look at what we have right here. Yeah, I mean, what, was, what do we know about this one? Owned by the city, purchased in March of this year for a sale price, full cash, no mortgages, liens, anything on it. And let's go down to uh, the most updated sales history right here. Bought it from an LLC. Yeah, they did. So uh, back in 2022, Swift Properties bought it from Penny Mac Loan Services. So they bought uh, an REO. Uh, Swift Properties then sold it. The buyer is the city of Des Moines. That's that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting uh, chain of events. Um, they they maybe have some home buyer program in Des Moines. I don't know what the scenario there would be, Um, but let's go, let's close that down and let's just go to the next one because it's just kind of interesting to to walk through this, right? So here's here's an LLC, uh, Henry, that you would have ignored, 
Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. That's right. That's Rob right there. Rob is <laughs> Rob owns that house. Yeah, no, I don't. But look at the <laughs> the seller, um, absentee owner, uh, REO bank owned, um, distant landlord, vacant, active buyer, and a cash buyer. So, uh, Jira, they're out of San Diego. It's very possible. Let's go down and just look at sales history. I wonder if they were the lender. Um, I don't know based on this, but I but they ended up with this house for fifty five thousand, and the reason I said I I wonder if they were the lender is because it says REO Bank owned because the REO yeah, um, so th it's very possible that they were the lender previously foreclosed and took the took the asset back and it's identifying that now, if they are the lender, does a lender want to own the real estate? Negative. No, they don't. They want they want out. Does a lender from San Diego want to own a vacant house in Des Moines, Iowa? Negative. Nope. Now we could we could do one other thing here. We're gonna go down uh, and does okay, that lender own other houses that, that they the, also don't want? That was the question. <laughs> Their portfolio. The owner of this property doesn't own any other properties. Okay, so. Get in the game. Get in the game. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to go through and I'm going to figure out what my offer is. I'm going to fill out the lead sheet in FreedomSoft. And it's going to take me 30 seconds to fill out the lead sheet uh, and and the offer section of the lead sheet. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to click send direct mail. I'm going to select right here, uh, mail a letter with offer plus a follow-up, I'm gonna add that to my sequence and I'm gonna send them an offer. And we're gonna be in the game. This is what most people don't do. You know what most people do, Rob? They look at those icons and they talk themselves out of why the seller's not interested in selling this house. <laughs> right. And the reason we built the icons is to show you all of the reasons they why are. this seller wants to sell. That's right. And they, they flip it. That's right. Their brain flips it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it goes back to the three reasons that you were talking about. They're going to let they're going to let different scenarios get in their way yeah. of not just doing the simple game that you're just showing here. Right. Well, as part of the 100 offer challenge, one of the things that we dive in a little bit deeper is, okay, I just showed you how to create a list of opportunities. And and I just showed you I'm going to click that button, I'm going to send them an offer. It's the stuff in the middle. It's the analysis paralysis. Everything we're talking about here is the six inches of gray matter between the two ears, right? One hundred percent. That's what the problem is. And so exactly the problem. During the hundred offer challenge, we show you how to create opportunities like this. Get confident in the structure of your offer. Get confident in the fact that your offer doesn't carry risk because you're going to make your offer in a in a very uh, solid way. We're going to show you how to calculate the offer that you should make and click the button and make the offer. Let me tell you the power in the 100 offer challenge from psychologically. All of us, even everybody sitting in this room, we're creatures of habit, and our habits dictate what we do consistently on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Yep. If you're not in the habit of making offers, that's what your habits will drive you to do is not make offers. Yep. So if I'm not in the habit of it, I'll look at something like this and be like, mm, bank owned, probably not a good deal. Right? right. And my habits will talk me out of and will find 10, 15, 20 reasons on why I shouldn't make an offer. That's right. When you blow through it. So when you commit to the hunter offer challenge and you actually make them, you start to rewrite the habits. That's right. Right. And Rob, you taught me this on day one, no offers equals no money. Yep. And you, you, you said, you said, Snyder, I can meet any real estate investor, ask them two questions and know exactly how they're doing. Question number one, how many offers have you made in the last seven days? Question number two, how many have you made in the last 30 days? Yep. And based on the answer to those questions, you can know exactly where their business sits. Yep. So what happens for all new investors, right? It doesn't matter if you're you know, born to a billionaire. If you decide that you want to start buying real estate, everybody starts at zero offers. So we all have that in common, yep. which I think is cool about real estate. But what happens is your norm is to not make offers. Yep. And so that's what you do. 
And because of that, you make no money with real estate. Exactly. What the 100 offer challenge is going to do is start to flip that norm. What, where the power comes in for investors, especially for newer ones, is when you can rewrite normal and your new normal is making offers, yep. you'll get to Wednesday in a week where an offer hasn't gone out and you'll get uncomfortable and think, holy crap, I got to make an offer this week. Yep. Because you reset normal, and now normal is pulling you towards profit. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's good. That's the power in the challenge, is it's going to rewrite normal, and once it's been rewritten, making offers will be your new norm. Not making offers will be abnormal, and your body, your mind, wants to move towards normal, and it'll drive you to continue making offers, which will continually put money in your pocket. That's right. So the challenge... Um, we call it the hundred offer challenge and that, you know, people are drawn to that. But in my mind, the real win is you're going to start to reset normal yeah. and get your brain on the right side of where you need to be. And once that happens, it's game on. Yep. Well, and if, you know, for, for the people listening to this or, or watching this on YouTube, when it's first released, um, we're in the middle of the challenge right now. We had, uh, as the, um, as of recording this, we're a week from starting, but when this gets released, we started yesterday. And you can still go to freedomsoft.com forward slash join the challenge, and you can join the 100 Offer Challenge. Now, there's a risk in calling it the 100 Offer Challenge because somebody is going to hear that and think, 100 offers, I I can't buy a hundred houses. A lot of somebody's. A lot of somebody's yeah. are. You know, I could call it the I could call it the one offer challenge. But the one offer challenge versus the hundred offer challenge doesn't rewire your brain and doesn't create new habits and doesn't pull you towards the the success that a hundred offers does. And so while there's risk in suggesting that someone is going to join the challenge and make a hundred offers, the reality is we're going to teach you how to do it. We're going to teach you how to do it with confidence, and we're going to show you how to make offers become part of your daily routine yeah it's the opportunity to just copy paste and just rinse and repeat that's right yeah that's right uh, because you know if if i were to make an offer on this house and uh if if i were to get it under contract at the price that i know is is going to work and that's going to take me literally 40 seconds to figure out uh and i'm gonna just going to make the offer um, when it comes time to the third thing that holds people back, right, there's the opportunities, there's the analysis paralysis, and then there's the exit strategy and the funding. How, what am I going to do if I get it under contract? Well, there's multiple exit strategies, right? Uh, the, the easiest one for newer people is to just go ahead and, and flip the contract, right? Just assign the contract to a local investor, uh, somebody that's actively buying, and you go build that list in FreedomSoft, and you find, you find the buyer that's looking for a deal. So simple. You start, with, you start with the area where this house is that you're under contract. You go build a list in the geography surrounding that, that house. You go find all the guys and gals that bought houses in the last 30, 60, 90, 180 days. There's your buyer. There's your exit strategy. There's your three thousand, your five thousand, your ten thousand, your fifteen thousand, your twenty-five thousand dollar payday. Mm -hmm. This part's fun. I like this part because I mean, even after you do that and you are exploring that list and trying to get that uh, contract out to those people, at the same time, simultaneously, you could be. This is where you start building relationships, and I talked about this a couple yep. weeks ago. Um, and if you're just starting out, um, this is. This is you learning about the market and getting really good at uh, building those relationships that you're going to sell to again and again and again. That's right. If you do it right. And at the same time here, I mean, this house, the house across the street could have been a recent flip two weeks ago. Yep. You could find that out easily by just being on the MLS, calling the realtor that flipped it for that investor on the open market. Right. Hey, does your guy want one more? the house across the street I have, right? That's right. It's another way that you could be doing it actively as well. Yep. Really easy. Yeah. And I, people, people complicate it mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be complicated. And, you know, 
I've coached people for years, and, and the biggest challenge, it, I can't get people to start, but once they start, there's no reason that we ever let them fail. But it's that, it's the start, it, it's the idea to start that is the biggest hurdle that people run into, you know, and they come up with a lot of reasons why they can't start. That's when their brain's chirping the loudest. That's right. For, for sure. That's right. It's chirping the loudest. Um, and they don't, they don't have the, the muscle built to say, I know what I'm going to do if I do take action and step up. They don't understand the next step. And so people have a fear of failing forward. Mm -hmm. uh, people that don't have that fear uh, have, a, have a lot faster time to, or a, a lot a shorter distance to success. And people that do have that fear get stuck in that analysis paralysis. I heard this explained one time. So this isn't my analogy, but I thought it was really helpful. And it, it fits in here. Uh, years ago, I was at a, just a business training event, and there was a guy on stage talking about there's a part of the brain, and he, he mentioned it. I have no idea what it was called, but um, he, he just called it the what-if part of your brain, and it's really useful. If you're going to cross train tracks or a road, you want your brain to say, what if there's a train or traffic coming? That makes sense, yep. okay? But that same part of the brain jumps in and uh, jumps into the conversation every time you're about to go do something, especially something new. Yep. And so... You, you join the hundred offer challenge and your brain is 100% for 100% of you listening to this. Yep. It's going to say, what if you can't do this? What if you can't find this? What if you can't do this? What if, what if, what if, and what we have to learn to control to do is to say, Hey, what if part of my brain? Thank you. I appreciate your input. I just don't need you in this scenario. Mm -hmm. If I'm about to cross the street or railroad train tracks, I need you to remind me to look not, not here, not now. So I like how he didn't tell the audience, and I was in the audience, he didn't say tell it to shut up. It's a valuable part of your brain. It was, I appreciate your input, but I don't need you now. And to help turn it off and then just follow the challenge. Beautiful. So hopefully that helps uh, at least a handful of people listening, if not all of you, because it's a valuable component. You don't need it now. That's and right. there's a lot of things that you're going to jump into where you can tell it, hey, I appreciate your input. I just don't need you for this. So Love go it. away for now. Love it. And get it out of the way and go rewrite normal. And th uh, there's some wording as a part of this challenge that says this will change your life. This is why. If Not if. When you reset norm, your normal, and when that new normal is making offers, nothing can slow you down. That's right. Yeah, I like that discernment's not bad right it's a good thing but it's obvious that making offers works right there are thousands and thousands of real estate investors out there that have figured this out yeah and they all started somewhere yeah right so there isn't an investor i mean there are investors who bought property years ago that are still making cash flow mm -hmm. but there isn't an investor who has made money without making an offer of some kind that's right like zero so if your desire is to make money with real estate you better get comfortable with the idea of making offers. That's right. Or else find something else. Yep. Right? And if your idea is to do it on a full-time basis and make it your livelihood and build your wealth and build your portfolio and create financial freedom, you should get comfortable sooner versus later, and you should get comfortable making a lot of offers on a regular basis. I don't wake up on a day-to-day -day basis and think, oh, I'm glad I don't have to make an offer today. I wake up and think, I wonder what an opportunity is that's going to come my way where I could make an, oppor uh, make an offer. Or how could I go create an opportunity right now a good point. to make an offer? And we just showed it 12 minutes ago on the podcast exactly how I would do it. Yeah, your, your wiring is more at this point now. And, you know, all of us are at that getting to that stage as well. But, I mean, your wiring is now it's like, I need more opportunities because I am that confident in, you know, I need to make more than a hundred offers. Right. Yep. And if I can't, then I'm very interested in figuring out where the heck I can go and find more opportunities just to even make an offer. 
because that's the name of the game. That's right. Yeah. Well, and if you if you run the math, right? If you make a hundred offers, the the likelihood that you're going to get one to three percent of those hundred offers accepted is is pretty high on a regularly consistent basis. So out of a hundred offers, you're going to get one to three accepted. Okay. Uh, out of those one to three accepted, let's just split the difference and say 2%. So two out of the 100 get accepted. And let's say out of the two, one of them you made, you just, you made the wrong assumption, right? The condition was significantly worse. The seller owed significantly more. Um, th there was something going on that prevented that deal from moving forward. So out of the two that got accepted, one of them falls to the wayside and one of them moves forward. Okay. That one that deal that moves forward, if you follow the process in our offer system is probably going to end up being a 10 to $15,000 payday. If you just flip the deal. It's a ten to fifteen thousand dollar payday if you just flip the deal. Now, depending on the market you're in, maybe it's a five thousand dollar payday, maybe it's a twenty-five thousand dollar payday, right? So the the market and the average price of the houses in the market you're in are going to dictate that end result. And the higher price market you're in, the ma the more offers you have to make in order to get that one accepted. The lower price, generally speaking the fewer offers you have to make. And so, but to make the same amount of money, it, it's about, it's about the same, you know, the higher price takes more offers to get the one bigger profit, lower price, you get more deals, but they're lower profits. So at the end of the day, by the time Equal. the high price guy closes his deal and makes his 25 grand, the low price guy is probably closed too. Yeah. It's washed. So they've made, yeah. they've washed. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, those are those are the things that that I think about when it it comes to comes to doing this mm -hmm. right, and that's that's why we're excited about what we've got going on right now. Uh, in the hundred offer challenge, uh, people are rewiring and they're getting to a good place. Um, guys, is there anything else that we want to talk about in this episode? I just think uh, you know if you are hitting a point where you're feeling discouraged or you're feeling some sort of uh, pressure or pain or, you know, get engaged, get back into proximity. If you're in this 100 offer challenge, you have access, right? We're doing lives every day. You can get engaged with those, ask those questions, get over those, you know, fears and yep. and act. And you're in proximity to those things and and... Uh, resources to get those questions answered. So I was just right. encourage people to to either jump on the challenge now, even though we're a day in, or if you're in the challenge, really get engaged in proximity to what you're doing. Love it. I was going to say your offer communicates to a seller that you can help them with their problem. That's it. I mean, imagine if you woke up with a piece of real estate, you couldn't sleep last night, you couldn't sleep for the last three months because you acquired it, however, but you don't know what to do with it. You don't even want to deal with it. Uh, and you're looking for a solution and yep. then an offer shows up. Mm -hmm. yep. That's what offers do. That's yep. right. Love it. Guys, that's a wrap. Uh, I just want to say this show, this episode has been brought to you by Freedom Soft. If you're interested in checking out more than just a CRM, a lead getting automation offer making machine, go check out Freedom Soft at freedomsoft.com. Um, if you like this episode, do us a favor and share it. Uh, just share it out on your on your socials. Um, subscribe and like it on YouTube uh, or on your favorite podcast app. And with all of that, guys, I think that's a wrap. We'll see him in the next episode. Later. Hey, it's Rob, and I just want to say thanks for listening. If you liked this, subscribe on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. That's going to keep myself and my team motivated to come back week after week and bring you the best content we possibly can. Now for that, I want to shout out specifically to Mike, Henry, Nick, and Joe here in the studio, punching the buttons, helping me make this show awesome. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next one.